like to bring the July 16th Planning Board meeting to to order. Um, you have the minutes of the previous <coughs> June 18th meeting in front of you. Are there any corrections or additions? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that the minutes be accepted as presented. Motion. Motion's been made and seconded. And all those in favor? Uh, minutes carried. <coughs> we have uh, some correspondence in front of us uh, that we haven't seen until just a few minutes ago, so if we, if we take a couple minutes and get up to date on that. <coughs>
We've received the uh, following correspondence since our last meeting. A letter from Elf Flocatulis regarding Blueberry Ridge. A letter from Jay Fastacci regarding Blueberry Ridge. A legal package from E. Parkinson regarding Blueberry Ridge. Recommendation to the Town Council regarding Bayview Road Vacation. A memo from Chief Williams regarding Dorsey. Cape Trails Day Report, Zoning News for 2002. In addition, tonight we had in front of us a letter from Jane Bullis, a letter from Thomas G. Peterson regarding Blueberry Ridge, and a letter from David G. Sawyer regarding Blueberry Ridge. First item on our agenda this evening is uh, Blueberry Ridge Subdivision Review. Uh, would you care to bring us up to date on the project, please? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Dave Camille. I'm a civil engineer with Land Use Consultants, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Joe Fasashi, who is the developer of Blueberry Ridge. I'm also here with um, Thomas Emery, who is a landscape architect with our firm. Um, what I'm going to do is just summarize for the board the changes that we've made to these plans since the last meeting. Um, they were relatively minor, but I'll just, I'll just go down through the list um, so that they'll be on the record. And then um, basically I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and then you can go to the public hearing and then we're available to answer any questions that you may have throughout the course of the evening. Um, most of these revisions were in response to comments that uh, were contained in a letter by the, um, the town's engineer, Steve Harding, and uh, it was dated uh, June 10th. Um, we have, uh, due to the size of the project, um, there's, there's 1.05 acres of impervious surfaces with the roads and the walkways and so forth, and um, there is a requirement under DEP rules for a um, stormwater permit whenever you have a project that has over an acre of impervious surfaces. So uh, based on that requirement, we have filed an application with the DEP for a stormwater permit, and that is um, pending with them at this time. Um, we checked with them today, and there really wasn't any um, progress to report other than that the, the, the application has been filed, and uh, their you know, ongoing review is um, going to take probably a month or two, so um, we're waiting for that. Um, we did add a stop sign. It shows up on plan sheet two at the uh, entrance to Blueberry uh, Road um, from Mitchell Road, and uh, there's a detail of that stop sign. It's on plan sheet three. Um, sheet number one, the, uh, the final plan, the recording plat, um, also shows the areas where the wetlands will be impacted uh, by the boardwalk <coughs> next to Lot 1. Um, the, uh, there, there's, a, there's a layout note um, and silt fence have been added to Plan Sheet 7 to uh, protect any of the wetlands that um, might be uh, affected by the construction of the detention basin. The, uh, the plans also showed a, uh, a sanitary sewer service connection from the uh, Flocatulis house, which is an existing house on Mitchell Road that crossed Blueberry um, Road. That was um, determined to be uh, incorrect, and uh, the actual connection to that sewer is actually in Mitchell Road, so it does not cross Blueberry Road, so we've taken it off of the plans. And, uh, so that won't be an issue for our road construction. Um, we were asked to put foundation drains for all of the lots connecting to the uh, storm drain system in the proposed roads. We've done that. Um, that shows on the uh, plan sheet seven and eight. And we've also added a note on sheet seven that um, states that these drains are to be positive gravity drains. Um, and the locations are noted as approximate because we don't exactly know what, what the houses will be built on these lots, and so they, they, they have some flexibility as to exactly where those drains go, but the point is that every lot will have a, um, a positive gravity drain connection, storm, storm drainage system. We added a note uh, to detail 14 on sheet 12, which um, 
refers to the, uh, the issue of um, encountering ledge when we're building the detention basins. If we do encounter ledge, we're going to over-excavate and uh, place a layer of clay and then put some topsoil on top of that so it'll be loamed and seeded. Um, and then we also added to that note that the public works director and the town engineer will be contacted if we do, in fact, um, encounter a ledge. Um, and uh, so they will have some oversight uh, you know, responsibility if, if that does occur. And uh, we've also added a, um, a detail for a wooden guardrail on uh, sheet 12, that's detail number 15. Um, and all the plans have been resubmitted in a full set, uh, 15 copies, which um, I assume I'll have a copy before you. Um, that essentially summarizes all of the, the changes that we've made since our last meeting. And I guess with that, I'll, 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 um, I'll turn it back to you and uh, answer questions as they come up. Thank you. At this time, uh, we've scheduled a public hearing. So I'll open the public hearing and uh, make a couple of comments before we do. Uh, I think there's quite a few people that would like to speak tonight. And typically, we would like to limit the speaking time to three minutes. Um, I will keep track of the time, and I will raise my right hand when the three minutes are up, and I'd appreciate it if you'd bring your comments to a close. Um, if there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak, uh, you can take the platform or the podium at this point. <clears throat> if you'd introduce yourself, your name and your address. My name is Jane Bolas. I live at 60 Edgewood Road in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, my family moved onto 60 Edgewood Road after buying a parcel of land from Joe Fristashi about nine years ago. We were told at that time that this was the only approved lot for a future subdivision to be developed. At that time, Mr. Fristashi was planning to build about eight homes with good sized lots. We knew that at some point the woods in front of our home would be made into a road that connected with the private road that we actually live on. Our home was situated to be facing a new yet to be built road. Our hope is and has been that we would live on a public road that connects to the community in which we live. We have maintained a turnaround for emergency vehicles as was requ required. Needless to say, since we've moved in, our South Portland neighbors have not always been rational. At one point, the South Portland Planning Board even threatened to take away our access into our driveway. It was only after frantic actions that South Portland sued to cut Mr. Fristashi off from his land and grant us easement that would allow us to access our land. It is disconcerting to know that an abutting community, which does not have my best interest at heart, has the right to make rules as they see fit. Easements, no easements, rights of way, no, no rights of way, discontinuing roads and lawsuits, this whole situation has been handled poorly. This has been a civic lesson in how to destroy the fabric of a neighborhood within two communities. The Dana Park Association's stance has solely been on how to stop the construction rather than looking for areas of compromise and cooperation to minimize the impact. Personally, we found ourselves defending our property access, diverting our attention from the subdivision. Like anyone, we love the woods that we live in and the benefits of living on a quiet residential street. But realistically, we know that Mr. Fristashi has a right to use his land within the town's ordinances. This is part of living in a community. We realize that most of the initial construction and blasting will be in our front yard. Our expectation is that we can continue to use Edgewood Road as our primary access to the South Portland businesses that we frequent, but we would hope to be joined with the community that we live in. South Portland has promised that our easement will last forever. From a South Portland Planning Board meeting, I quote, people may come and go, but South Portland will be here long past our lives. And these two houses, meaning the last two houses on Edgewood Road in Cape Elizabeth, have a right to access their property, end of quote. But now they are threatening to take away the easement if Cape Elizabeth does not give South Portland citizens their way. We believe that Mr. Prestashi's plan is viable. The traffic generated by the new home should not present an additional safety hazard. In closing, thank you for your consideration for our, of our request to make Redfern Drive a through street so that we can feel connected to our new neighbors, a feeling that we have not had. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> A 
Uh, good evening, Mr. Griffin, uh, members of the planning board. My name is Robert Crawford, and I represent uh, David and Elizabeth Sawyer, Yolan Fogg, uh, Tom and Marion Peterson, and Lee Bumstead. Uh, we've been here before. Uh, we had some uh, input early on in the process, but I'd like to just point to a couple issues here, and I'll try to race through them as quickly as I can, because I think it's important to get them on the record. We're here tonight to uh, have a hearing on the final approval of the subdivision, which is covered under your ordinances, I believe, at section 16.2-4. There's a couple of points I would like you to consider in your deliberations and consideration, and those are set forth at page 14 of the subdivision ordinance, and they relate to, at this point in time, I think some irregularities in the process, and I, I think we're a little bit uh, card ahead of the horse in this, in this whole procedure. Um, 16.2.4.9, small c, 2A, requires written evidence of approval and issuance of all permits from licenses from the federal and state agencies for you folks to act on your approval. Um, subpart 2D under that also indicates that if there are any drainage easements that are required, that those also have to be obtained at this point. I don't think the application, uh, due to the drainage issues that are outstanding, that are also part of the DEP approval process, are finalized or resolved at this point, so it would be premature to act on them. We would also uh, have some problems here with what is posited in terms of Mr. Camillo's drainage plan. The position that's, that's posited on the drainage plan that's before you in the sheets is that now water drains into South Portland at the, Sh on the Charlotte Street end of it. It doesn't. You can go there and look at yourself and you can see it doesn't drain that way. It drains from Charlotte Street into, into Cape. After the project's completed, Mr. Camilla is suggesting close in the room, that uh, less, there will be um, less water that drains into South Portland. But the truth of it is, is that the water now doesn't drain into South Portland, and that after it will drain into South Portland, and it may require some additional easements and some other things that will be uh, the subject of the DEP review. So I think that you need to consider that in, uh, in your deliberations and, and uh, concerns here this evening. The other thing I'd like to point to is there's been correspondence to the Cape, of Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth officials from Mary Call, the city's attorney. If, in fact, you're going to rely on the city of South Portland's catchment basements and stormwater sewage uh, or stormwater drainage system, the city's not presently uh, disposed to accept that water without going through some formal process and uh, discussion. Um, the other question that, are, that arises in connection with this uh, proposal here before you is the wetlands. You're relying tonight on a wetland study that's over 10 years old for the majority of this property. Now, it's true that Mr. Sweet came in and did an update, but he only did one acre area, and that's the area that Mr. Fristacci obtained here for the new access into the subdivision. I say new access because it's different than the earlier plans. I contacted the main DEP and I contacted the Army Corps of Engineers and both of them told me that they won't rely on wetland studies that are over five years old. So I think you would, you know, if it's appropriate, you probably need to look at that. And the wetlands issue is a significant element in all of this because, as you know, that's going to determine the, the developable acreage and everything else along the way. So I suggest that you, that you do so and you, and you take a look at that and perhaps require a little bit of extra diligence on that. In terms of the zoning ordinance, two major issues that we've identified. If you look under section 19-7-2.C-6, which deals with the um, open space zoning, there's a requirement that there has to be 50 feet between building envelopes. I know Mr. Parkinson's here tonight. He may give you some uh, guidance on that. But our position is that it's there. It's in the ordinance clear. What's proposed here doesn't include a 50-foot setback from the or from the building envelopes in South Portland, which are now a matter of record in the Registry of Deeds, uh, pursuant to discussions with Ms. O'Mara. The other thing under that same section of the ordinance is that there's a requirement that any building envelope be located further than 75 feet of, from the end of any right-of-way of a road in existence as of before June 4th of 1997. Charlotte Street ended here before 1997. This lot, number 12, the building envelope on that, you can sketch, you know, scope it right off of here. It doesn't satisfy that criteria. And that's irrespective of whether you include the 25 feet that's been discontinued or not. It's not within 75 feet from the end of that road. <clears throat> There's also some concerns we have with the vegetative buffers. Two places to look for guidance on that from the planning board's perspective. One is section 19-7-2 
D1, small d, which talks about vegetative buyer buffers being required to preserve or allow establishment to serve as an effective visual screen from adjacent properties as part of the open space planning. The second place to look is in the subdivision ordinance, section 16-3-1, small c, indicates that vegetative cover is to be preserved or placed to provide adequate buffering between the residences. Stockade fences are not vegetative buffers. We'd appreciate it if you would look at that. There was some early conversation and discussion in the initial part of the application related to the trees that are located on the city. And you know from your inspection, it's a beautifully wooded area. In the ordinance, again, section 16-3-1 under the subdivision ordinance, there's a, 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 a statement in there that one needs to first inventory the trees that are uh, greater than 10 inches in diameter, and then also make measures to protect those trees. If we have aggressive drainages, things like that installed around here, things like that, those trees are gone, they're history, they're not part of the project, we'd like you to look at that. The other questions that have come up have been in connection with the traffic study. Mr. Bray's update, February 3rd, 2002, by letter to the, to the uh, board here. He looked at issues related to access off on Mitchell Road and through this way to Edgewood. But what's missing from that analysis is an analysis of how many people are going to cut the corner and go through that. That's not good for the residents that are going to be located in this subdivision. It's not good for my clients who live further down the road. <coughs> What I'd like to do uh, is turn over some other things here uh, to Mr. Sawyer, who's going to talk to you a little bit about what you could do as a planning board to, to mitigate some of these decisions. And primarily that is to take the subdivision and put some buffer along the outer stretch here, perhaps have a walkway in here that accesses this open space. It'll give people from this subdivision an opportunity to traverse up and down the Charlotte Street way as a way to get over to that part of the world when they want to go over to the commercial district one way or another. So I think that would be one way to get this very far along in the thinking process to give Mr. Fristacci what he needs, the laudable goals of this development for low income housing in your community. And also, it works for both sides of the fence. Do these people really want to be pushed up into the backyard of the neighbors? Why not give them the buffer, that 50 foot that's required under the ordinance? It's a win-win on both sides. I thank you. I've probably gone over my, my time there. Really would like you folks to consider those points. Thank you. My name is David Sawyer, 10 Charlotte Street, South Portland. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address just a point that was made up by, by uh, Mrs. Bolas and her uh, statement that the city of South Portland was going to cut off her access. And I just want to assure you there was never intent, in, intent by the city or our neighbors or anyone to prevent access to her property. And I'm sure whatever happens one way or the other, she'll have access. They live on a, a private road right now, a private uh, road, and they have an easement across both the Prestashi property and the city property. The city was very careful to make sure they kept that easement uh, when they shut the street down. So uh, I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, Mr. Crawford has already s uh, spoken about the plan and, uh, and some of the issues of concern. One of my issues of concern was trees. My, my, our engineer stated that it's going to be such dramatic uh, blasting and filling in here that there won't be any trees left in here. If there are, uh, they won't last very long. I know uh, Mr. Fristashi stated in the paper the other day that uh, he's going to try to uh, protect the trees within the 20-foot uh, setback, which is all well and good. He may, he may do that, but there's no protection in there for the, the residents. Uh, so he may keep the trees, and in the minute somebody moves in there, they could strip out the trees, and there's no protection or vegetative buffer, as we call it, built into the plan. Some of my problems with the plan is, I looked at it and I said, what's wrong with this plan? And what I see is wrong is that if you, if you live in this block, for example, and you wanted to walk down to Cumberland Farms to get a loaf of bread, you can't do that. You can't get out onto Charlotte Street. You have to go, you'd have to go all the way around this way, or you'd have to go around out Mitchell Road. So for the residents in there to, to get into the community, they can't do that. And also, conversely, within the South Portland abutters, you can't get to the open space without a long way around. And I think there's a way that you, in fact, I played with the plan a little bit. And if you move this road 
down this way a little bit and move it in this way, you could leave a buffer area, a vegetated buffer, along the uh, butter's property line. You could have a few spots where people could get in and out. And the only downside of that is you might lose these two lots here because they're right close to the wetland. Uh, but you could always add two lots over here if you want to to make up for that. Or you might have feel that the uh, benefits outweigh the, the, the problem of just losing two lots. So I'd like to have, have you think about that. Another possible alternative that could happen is that uh, uh, someone could put in a, a condominium uh, in there, which would be uh, a lot lower intensive use of the land. And we would be in favor of something like that. And also, there's the uh, still the possibility of uh, insisting that uh, traditional zoning go in there with the 20,000 square foot lots. There's plenty of room on that. I think there's about 14 and a half acres left in there. Uh, there's just one other thing that I wanted to mention. I did. Uh, I, I had heard it said at the South Portland meeting that uh, Mr. Fistachi had contacted the state planning office and gotten their endorsement, so to speak. So I called up uh, Evan Rickard, who's in the state planning office, and asked him about it. And he said that he definitely did not endorse this plan. And I asked him, I spoke with him. The gist of it is that um, clustering, I mean, the state obviously is, is pushing clustering and anti-sprawl and so forth. But this, but this particular plan is not integrated into the community. There's no flow in and out of that. You're taking our neighborhood over here, you're expanding it, but then you're putting up these walls all around it, so it's kind of a gated, separate community, and yet it's integrated in a funny kind of a way. So that it's, it's got some problems that way, and that's why the state would not endorse that plan, and that's what I was told. But I wanted to just mention that. I think that's about it. Um, I would just like to say that we would like to have in this plan some of the amenities that have been offered in other plans in Cape Elizabeth and South Portland. For example, over on uh, Rosewood Drive, uh, there's cutting envelopes. There's places where you can't cut the trees. And um, if you're not in a building envelope, you're, you can't cut outside of that building envelope. So I'd like the board to consider making areas that are not inside the building envelope subject to restrictive restrictions on cutting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lee Bumstead. It's B-U-M-S-T-E-D. I live at 58 Gowdy Street, South Portland. I have two topics this evening that are specific questions for Mr. Fustashi and or his representatives, and some questions and comments regarding the 50-foot setback requirement. Uh, Mr. Griffin, is the format of this hearing such that I would ask the questions and Mr. Fristashi would answer, or do I sort of give you the questions and then you relay them? You ask the questions and then he will respond at the, at the closing of the hearing. Okay, thank you. Um, my first question, um, we've been told on numerous occasions um, by Mr. Emery, the landscape planner, uh, by Ms. O'Meara, and it's also in the landscape proposal itself, that almost all the trees directly behind our homes on, 50, on, on Gowdy Street are to be torn down, even the 80 to 100 year old oak and maples that are within 10 or 15 feet of our property. Um, for instance, in the um, land use consultant's February 1st submission to the landscape plan, Mr. Camilla states that due to, quote, due to existing site conditions and proposed development patterns, it is assumed that few existing trees will remain or would be safe to retain within the road right of way or adjacent to proposed house sites. Yet in yesterday's paper in the Press Herald on page 3B, Selena Ricks wrote, a buffer, quote, a buffer of wooden fencing and shrubbery has been proposed. And Frustashi says many of the mature oak, maple, and pine trees will be left as buffer. And then she quotes Mr. Frustashi as saying, we'll save the vegetation on the last 20-foot strip between Gowdy Street and the subdivision, end quote. This directly contradicts everything we've been hearing over the last seven months. So I guess the question is, did, did Ms. Ricks misquote Mr. Fristashi, or is, has there been a change to the landscape plan? Um, and I ask that because I continue to ask that we save some of those trees. There's some more wonderful old trees. There's some small little 
10, 15 year old trees, all of which would still contribute to the sense of privacy, to the shading that my garden requires to continue what I planted out there. Um, it's just a shame um, to be losing all that. My, I have a fence right here, and I have plantings right up against it there. And uh, we lose all those trees. Some of them are only like this far from my fence, but I could lose all of those under the current plan. Um, so I would ask you to, again, try to stipulate that we hang on to what mature vegetation and even some of the nice immature vegetation that could grow to be something much better than a little five-foot pine tree. Um, my second question to Mr. Fristashi and his representatives, um, this landscape plan is showing a fence directly behind, on the property line and crossing about a third of the way across here. Maybe not quite a third, but it's crossing into my property. Um, and I understand from talking um, with your code enforcement officer and with Ms. O'Meara that the fence typically, the new fence is going to be right on the property line. I've already got a fence. So my question is, how do I maintain my fence? And how would the new homeowner paint or stain a wooden fence which would be required to maintain it? Um, I understand you have no fence ordinances so that my expectation would be, Ms. O'Meara has indicated, it's going to be right up flush on the property line. And then thirdly, and this is just more of a comment on the 50-foot setback, um, I'd be real interested to hear, I guess, from the board as to why your ordinance requiring a 50-foot rear setback from our building envelopes has been basically ignored. You know, why didn't we hear a detailed discussion? Why wasn't significant? I mean, I heard some questions. And I do thank you folks for the questions you did raise. But I, it seemed like you asked the questions, you didn't get <laughs> substantive responses, significant justifications for why there shouldn't be a 50-foot setback. You know, there was some wisdom there. The people who drew up section 19-7-2-C.6, when they set up that 50-foot setback requirement, and it seems, I'd like to know why that was set aside, I guess, why that wisdom was ignored. And then just why are the concerns, the abutters, about our loss of privacy, our loss of property value, not given more weight than they are? It seems like everything's weighted to what the developer wants, and very little is weighted towards us, and, and we live there too. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your consideration. My name is James Cannon. I live at uh, 12 Phillips Road in South Portland. Right over here. And uh, my primary concern this evening um, when I came in is Edgewood and uh, Redfern Drive. Um, however, after, uh, after hearing other discussions so far, um, I believe that uh, you as the planning board have a great deal to consider, and especially um, the, uh, the buffers and the ordinance that your town is, has adopted and, and how that, that should be adhered to. But the, the, what I'm looking at on uh, when I see Red Oak Drive um, coming up to Edgewood, the two properties on Cape Elizabeth that are on the private road, um, is is basically a, a very thinly veiled attempt to uh, to kind of conform with what's going on, but it flies in the face of the intent of the city of South Portland when they discontinued Edgewood. That's a discontinued road, and the developer is showing a road that goes up to it, and uh, he's kind of, I guess, thinking that a couple years down the road things might cool off, and, uh, and he can just, if he, if he doesn't get approval for it now, can, can blow the road through later. And have that become a through road from Mitchell to Cottage that, uh, that would be of little benefit to the people who currently live on Edgewood, who currently live on Phillips, Charlotte, Gowdy, but it would be uh, a benefit to those folks who want to cross from uh, Mitchell to Cottage um, in, in one more spot. Gowdy is a, a dead end street. The streets um, beyond it are, are one way to specifically uh, make it inconvenient for people to pass from Mitchell to Cottage. And uh, if you blow Red Oak Drive onto to Edgewood, it'll just create that thoroughfare. A developer does not have the right of access to any road that he abuts. I'm in the real estate development business myself, and I have worked on properties where we abut three streets, but the planning board, um, in its wisdom and considering the pleas of the people who live in the houses nearby the development 
saw it fit to only allow us to have one access on one road. You do not need to have access on every road that you abut. To allow Red Oak Drive to connect to Edgewood would, as I said before, fly in the face of the intent of the city of South Portland. It may not benefit Blueberry Ridge, whatever this is called. Um, I'm sure that the folks who buy houses there would appreciate it being quiet and would appreciate the uh, access being only onto Mitchell from their street there on Red Oak. So I hope that you consider that. I hope that you consider the fact that you are charged with making this a development that not only works for the developer, but it works for the people who own homes, who have owned homes for a great period of time, the people who live in the, uh, the city next to yours, and, uh, and who, have, who have told you that uh, they do not want to see that access go through. I'm telling you I do not want to see that access go through. I believe that this development will be successful without that access, and it will be a better development with less access and more responsible growth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Are there any other interested parties? Would you like another couple minutes? No, I just have something I wanted to submit. I, I left it on the dinner table. I apologize. Uh, Rob Crawford back again. I have a correspondence from uh, Mr. Jordan, which I received today. The last letter of concern related to the drainage issues as uh, provided to my clients, the Sawyers, by Mr. Bushy has been uh, previously provided to you. There was some suggestion in Mr. Bushy's correspondence that the city should undertake some examination of those. Mr. Jordan has addressed that in, in these, and I just wanted to have it for you folks to have it on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That's OK. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, the board. Um, my name is Julianne Eberl, and I live at 54 Edgewood Road. Uh, and I just have a brief statement to read. Um, we in South Portland are an excellent example of cluster zoning. Uh, we, uh, the abutters, are on 7,000 square foot lots. Our 50-year-old and older homes are quality construction. And we have retained our 100-year-old trees. In contrast, Mr. Frastacci's recently built condominiums nearby have basements that are now filling with water, and the planning board has directed changes for these structures. In today's Press Herald's editorial, the implication has been made that we in South Portland, the abutters, are opposed to cluster zoning. In fact, we strongly embrace it. We embrace this concept. We welcome our new neighbors in Blueberry Ridge. However, we ask that this cluster zoned project be properly constructed and respect existing zoning regulations of the city of Cape Elizabeth. The city of Cape Elizabeth needn't face, a, face future problems and opprobrium based on a poorly considered decision made today. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? And I will deem this hearing closed. And uh, I will uh, offer an opportunity for the applicant, if uh, he so chooses, to uh, address any of the issues that were raised. Good evening, my name is Joe Fostacci. I'm the developer, Blueberry Ridge. Um, allow me to address a couple of the issues made. David Sawyer made reference to a plan submitted to the State Planning Office for review. I, in fact, did submit a plan to John Del Vecchio for his review, or his uh, agency's review. And that was a plan that connected 
Charlotte, and Edgewood Streets, not this plan that's before you this evening or that has been before you for the past year. Uh, that plan uh, showed uh, connecting communities, connecting streets, and also provided the buffer that David Sawyer was so um, careful to identify uh, as a potential change to this plan. So we did submit a plan uh, a couple of years ago to the State Planning Office that had everything that the people of South Portland are requesting today. But that plan was scrapped because the two streets were vacated. Ms. Bumstead referred to uh, the 20-foot buffer and trees. And I think that land use consultants, David Camilla and Tom Emery, have attempted to be cautious in their um, analysis of what might happen to the trees in the 20-foot buffer. Uh, Tom Emery very clearly stated that uh, we're not going to promise you that the trees would stay, but as the builder, as the developer of the land, we're going to do everything we possibly can to keep the, the trees in the 20-foot buffer. Certainly, if we're adding vegetation as a buffer, uh, it would be foolish for us to cut trees down and then replace them with more costly trees. So uh, to answer your question, Ms. Bumstead, we, we are planning to keep as many trees, or all trees, that we possibly can. Um, getting back to David Sawyer's comments about no cut area. Yes, in the Rosewood subdivision, um, we do have a, an identified building envelope, and everything outside that envelope is in the no cut area. Uh, we can't guarantee that uh, trees outside the building envelope will be in a no-cut uh, building envelope. Uh, that, that strip is 20 feet by, by 30 feet uh, bordering the property. So it's, it's difficult to not cut trees down on the sides when you need area to work around the, tree, around the, um, around the property to basically build the house. Uh, fences on the property line. Again, this is Ms. Bumstead's uh, question. Um, if you look at the plan very carefully, it's going to be a mix of vegetation and or um, stockade fencing. And in your particular case, it might be ideal to have the vegetation there and not an additional fence. Uh, so um, I think the plan will clearly state that uh, either or will be utilized. And every case, every, every situation is different. And where there are fences in place, and I think there's two other properties that have a stockade fence, uh, we might extend that stockade fence or add vegetation. I've talked with four abutters, and four abutters have asked, can we work together? And I said, absolutely, we can. So we are working with people to provide them with, with what they want. And these are the abutters now, not the people that are buying the home. But we hope to be able to work with all the abutters to provide adequate buffering. Um, and I think those were the those were the questions. Um, I, I, one, other, one other thing I must state. I did build Victoria Court. I was not the developer of it, and the basements are very dry. They run positive drains, and there's absolutely no water in those basements. Tom mentioned access through the neighborhood. We do have access the best that we can. Uh, we had the pedestrian easement that was in place in 92, and we've maintained that easement coming from Edgewood and between lots five and six. We are providing uh, access uh, from the neighborhood uh, to areas in South Portland, which, which we were allowed to do. And Tom, Dave, want to address anything? I just want to uh, briefly mention the issue of um, carefully planned communities, the issues of buffers, and the issue of double jeopardy. Uh, on the one hand, we hear from the abutters in South Portland that we're not providing access, we're, we're destroying their sense of community, yet on the other hand, the city of South Portland, with the uh, pushing of the abutters, have uh, discontinued access through those neighborhoods. Uh, I have in my portfolio a plan of a, a similar development in Cape Elizabeth, uh, where I live, and there are several streets that empty out into Route 77, a busy street. There are several cross streets, and there are many streets uh, leading from Route 77 
it's typically felt that a single access is, is to be avoided, that you want multiple accesses so that you don't end up with dead-end neighborhoods that then don't contribute and interact with other neighborhoods. So it's very difficult to respond to the issue on the one hand that we're not providing access to Mitchell Road and access through our development when at the same time we're not being permitted to do so uh, by the South Portland abutters. Uh, we have successfully negotiated uh, with the South Portland abutter who was willing to meet with us. Uh, we would be more than pleased to meet with any of the abutters that want to discuss the issue of the buffer and what might be protected uh, on a lot by lot basis. We are in a situation now, I think everybody's aware that uh, it's a litigious environment and uh, we have to put forth a plan that we feel comfortable, uh, that we can support and that will provide the, the buffering to the uh, best extent, extent practicable. Uh, we have offered several choices in buffering. One is fencing, one is in landscaping. We're certainly willing to, to look at either uh, option uh, for those who would be uh, preferring something other than just fencing. Thank you. Just one other comment, and I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier. Um, it's been discussed and questioned and, and tossed around a number of times um, regarding the 50-foot setback from the building envelopes and the 75-foot setback from existing streets. Under the open space zoning, section 19-7-2, um, the, there are um, options uh, that are presented for the board to review and consider, and that's in, in a residence uh, A district and a residence C district, which this is. The provisions of this section shall be optional. So the setback, the 50-foot setback and the 75-foot setback are optional. And the planning board in reviewing and approving proposed residential subdivisions may modify provisions relating to space and bulk to permit innovative approaches to housing and environmental design in accordance with the standards of this article. And we are asking for a modification of the provisions and to reduce the um, side setbacks uh, from 20 feet to 15 feet uh, and the um, waiver of the 50-foot uh, setback from an existing building envelope in a uh, waiver of the 75-foot um, buffer or setback from the existing streets. And I um, will point out, and we, we've, we've asked for this from day one, from the uh, inception of this plan. Uh, we're not the first ones that are asking for this. You did it in a wheelback subdivision, I believe um, the um, Cross Hill subdivision, also cluster housing subdivision, but reduced uh, setbacks, and uh, we're asking for a similar treatment, and, up, and our application shows that. So, in, in response to the questions, um, it's very clear in section 19-7-2A2 that the planning board has the um, the option to modify these provisions. Is there any uh, questions or discussions that the board members have at this time? I just have one question. That is the letter from the other engineer. Um, Mr. Camilla, could you comment about that? Have you had a chance to read it? The bushy letter? Yes, I yes. have. Could you just comment because, I, I mean, there, there's some... <clears throat> this is the, the June 30 letter mm -hmm. to uh, David and Elizabeth and Sawyer. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, sure, I'll, I guess I'll just, just go down. I um, think it might be helpful for people to yeah. um, get memories refreshed. I mean, he asked for an easement um, in his first point um, on the sidelines of lots 11, 12, and 13, which uh, put this plan up here to stay.
lots 11 12 and 13 which essentially are the three lots that are in the proximity of the end of, of Charlotte Road there's been an awful lot of discussion about this issue and um, this this board just just so it gives you a general sense the yellow area that I've shaded is the area when the project is completed that will be continuing to flow in the direction of the uh, the end of Charlotte Road the red cross-hatched area. This, in addition to the yellow shaded area, is the area that, based on the topography, drains in this direction now. Um, so the point of this plan is really to show how much of a reduction there is in the area that will continue to drain off in this direction. Essentially what's going to happen is all of the new homes, you know, we're talking about lots eight, nine, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, which essentially are within a drainage area that does flow this way now, will all be flowing into the drainage system in Blueberry Road and onto the detention basins. The only area that's gonna remain that will flow in this direction is the existing home um, here on uh, Edgewood Road, um, as well as some of the backyards of these um, proposed new homes. There's not a lot that's going to happen back here. And uh, a lot of the, the comments and, and discussion about this whole situation has sort of alluded to the fact that we're going to be sending drainage into a catch basin that doesn't go there now. And the question is, does it in fact flow into that basin? I guess that's still somewhat of an open issue. My opinion is that at some point it does. It, it, may, it may pond in this area because there is a depression there but it has no place else to go so if it does reach a level that it can flow into this basin I believe that it will um, for the most part I think a lot of this just infiltrates into the ground which is a good thing from a drainage perspective um, as a matter of fact the DEP is in the process of revising their own stormwater rules and they're trying to encourage infiltration so that they will get more water into the ground to replenish the groundwater table and maintain base flows and streams. But um, we are not proposing to make a great deal of changes in this area. We're gonna reduce the amount of area that goes here significantly and the amount of flow based on our calculations will be significantly less. Whether it actually goes into that basin or not, I guess is somewhat irrelevant. It goes wherever it's going now, it's gonna to continue to go. And uh, if it flows into the basin, it will flow into the basin if it just percolates into the ground, then it will percolate into the ground. Um, you know, it's very flat out here, and uh, based on the photograph that I submitted on one of my earlier uh, submissions, it appeared to me that you could see, because there was a little bit of snow on the ground, that in fact some flow was going in the direction of that basin. Um, that's my opinion. Um, Mr. Bushy disagrees with me, but uh, in any case, uh, we don't feel that there's an issue in terms of making a direct connection. We don't feel we need an easement. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I know this comes up from time to time that drainage, if you're not pr proposing to put a pipe on someone's property line, but your, your lot happens to drain to their lot, you have a, a right to do that because that's the way it is now and you aren't prevented from continuing to use that method of drainage as long as you're not going to increase it and, and cause some sort of a flooding problem for your neighbor. And that certainly isn't the case here. We're, we're significantly reducing the amount of drainage that heads in that direction. So I just want to make that clear. We're not increasing drainage and we don't feel we need an easement for what we're proposing to do. Um, he asked the question, who owns the discontinued portion of Charlotte Street? I guess I just saw a letter from uh, the city manager in South Portland, Jeff Jordan, that apparently these um, homeowners on both sides of the discontinued portion granted back to the city their rights in that um, underlying uh, uh, fee so that the city of South Portland, I guess, owns Charlotte Street that's discontinued. Um, what prevents through traffic between Red Oak Drive and Edwards Road? Um, 
physically nothing. Um, legally, the street doesn't um, exist anymore, even though the pavement is still there and the two homes that are uh, in Cape Elizabeth have a right to pass that way. Um, it's an enforcement issue. I don't know whose responsibility, if it's the city of South Portland or the city of Cape Elizabeth, to prevent that from happening. In theory, I suppose, they could put a gate across the road and give a key to the two homeowners who have rights to pass. Not very practical, but I mean, it would, in fact, deal with that issue. I think it's a question of um, enforcement, and uh, we don't really have the answer to it, but I believe it's a, it's a responsibility for the, the city of South Portland, who is, has, the, as I understand it, the interest in preventing that from happening. Um, so I guess it really it falls on them. Um, number four, he recommends that Red Oak Drive include curving and catch basins. Um, otherwise, you'd have to have uh, driveway culverts. The way this is designed, it is just um, swale to a couple of catch basins, and, and there are you know a couple of driveways that will have culverts, and we have no problem with that. So um, I guess we agree with him on that point. Um, number five. He asks um, why the pre-development drainage plan has a directional arrow implying that the end of Charlotte Street drains towards the site and in the post-development is directed to the end of Charlotte Street and your property. I'm not sure exactly what his point is there, but um, I think he may be thinking of these, these arrows that show up on the, the delineations of the watershed boundaries. Those aren't intended to be directional flow arrows. All they, all they mean is that within this polygon, if you will, the flow is contained within that polygon. Same thing here. I mean, this arrow right here doesn't mean that the flow goes exactly that way, but it stays within the polygon. So I think he just maybe misunderstood the arrows that we put on the plan. But um, I guess my explanation earlier as to how the drainage works at the end of Charlotte Road, I guess, uh, is the best I can do on that. Um, number six, has the South Portland Engineering Department signed off on the project? No, they haven't. We haven't approached them. And I guess also in Jeff Jordan's letter, um, he makes the point that there is no provision and there is no mechanism for this sort of sign-off. So um, that, uh, I guess that's, that's the answer to that. Number seven, um, he recommends a buffer on the rear of lots 11, 12, and 13, similar to the other lots. We do leave more area. There, I, I believe there's, there's 25 feet here instead of 20. Um, you heard Mr. Fustachi earlier. Um, you know, we made the statement that there's no guarantee that these trees will stay. Um, when you're building houses, you know, know exactly what the house footprint will be. If the house is big enough so that it reaches the outer limits of the building window, then it's tough to keep those trees. If it's a smaller house, then it's very easy to keep those trees. And not knowing, um, we made a, a conservative statement that, that it, it would be likely that these trees might not stay. I believe Mr. Fustachi um, will do everything he can to preserve the trees, but um, it's a case-by-case -case, uh, situation you have to evaluate when you're actually on the site building the house. So I guess you've heard what he had to say, and I, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll let that stand. Um, number eight, a test pit in the proposed uh, stormwater detention basin for uh, groundwater and rock depths. Um, Mr. Fatashi stated earlier at a, a previous meeting that there have been test pits dug in the vicinity of those detention basins. There was a previous home there, I believe, um, that uh, has been torn down and he didn't encounter any bedrock. So um, we, we, we do have that much information. Um, you know, I, I suppose if it comes down to that, we could certainly do another test pit if that's, uh, if that's going to be an issue. Um, we do have a proposal within our um, design now if we do encounter a ledge, how we will deal with that. So um, I guess, uh, you know, unless there's some issue um, beyond the fact that uh, there might be ledge there, I don't know what the point of that test pit is going to serve at this stage in the game. But, uh, those are his eight points. I guess um, that's that's my response to those. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Mr. Camilla, if, if, if I'm understanding some of the concerns, as you point out, the yellow area is much smaller than the com combined yellow and red area. So less square footage is draining somewhat in the direction of Charlotte Road. Uh, has the topography of that yellow area changed in such a way that there would be more of a tendency for water to head towards Charlotte Road as opposed to percolating into the ground? Not really. I mean, there'll, there'll be some grading, you know, around this building window. There's going to be some grading around this. Um, lot, lot 11 is a very large um, building window. So, I mean, a house could be built entirely outside of the yellow area or it could be built almost entirely within the yellow area. My hunch is it'll probably be a little bit of both. 
but um, here again we're speculating we don't know but even if they graded out the backyard of that lot it isn't going to change the general flow here which which tends to be downhill this is this is the high point on the property and it all goes downhill in this direction this area here is very flat um, we have a proposed contour in our final grading which goes around these two building windows which is um, contour contour 80 and it, it, it goes from here on the, uh, the, the the South Portland boundary with the Gowdy Street lots all the way across the backs of lot 13 and 12 and that really just shows how flat that is it's going to be the same elevation across the backyards here for um, you know quite a distance um, you know, what we're talking about really in this area is what we call micro relief it's 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 it's, it's changes that are are smaller than the contour interval that the original survey work was done at, so you just don't see what is really going on there. Um, and uh, I guess my my earlier explanation about the fact that this water actually sits there and it doesn't flow readily into this catch base, and it does have to pond to a certain elevation in order to be able to flow into it. But the fact that it's ponding is a good thing. It isn't going into a drainage system, so it isn't causing any sort of downstream impact to anybody else's infrastructure. It's soaking into the ground. It's replenishing the uh, groundwater table, which, uh, you know, does lots of things. It, uh, it keeps the base flow going in streams, for one, which is one of the big issues at DEP right now that they're concerned about stormwater being collected in paved areas and piped off to a stream directly um, rather than letting it percolate into the ground, replenish the groundwater table and keep a base flow going in streams so that they flow during the dry times of year as well as during the, the wet times of the year. So. Okay, so, so not to cut you off, but um, in simple terms for a layman like me, so you're not sloping the land in such a way that there's suddenly an increased no, amount no. of we're, we're just doing some, some grading around the backyards of the lots, the normal grading that you do when you build a house. And you and build it up around the foundation and, and it, it grades off to the backyard. Okay, thanks. Can you also comment on, the town engineer has mentioned a couple of times in his reviews about uh, determining what's the elevation of the catch basin on Charlotte Road and how that relates to this this land in Blueberry Ridge. I mean, the is that an important piece of data? Yeah, I don't know if we have a spot elevation on there. I don't believe there is one. Um, it Does that help resolve this? I, I would certainly tell you what the elevation of the, of the, uh, the rim is um, in relationship to uh, the backyards of these lots, yeah. I mean, I think it's obvious anyone who goes out there that it's, it's somewhat higher. Um, it's not much higher. You know, we're talking, you know, plus or minus a foot here. Um, okay, thanks. Just, <clears throat> just to clarify that, the, the basin on Charlotte is a foot higher or lower? I think that, well, just, I, would, just, my, I guess based on my observation, yeah. and this wasn't with the survey, this was just standing there looking at this, that there were probably places out here in the backyard of, say, Lot 12, which, which covers the entire end of Charlotte Street, that might be a foot below that rim of that basin. Because the, the basin is actually set rather awkwardly. It's in the middle of, I believe it's Mr. Sawyer's driveway, and it isn't in a depression. Normally you set a catch basin lower than the surrounding pavement so that the water will flow into it. This particular catch basin seems to be relatively flush in the pavement, and it might even be a little bit higher than some of the other pavement around it. So it doesn't lend itself for flow to go into it very easily. Even from the paved areas, I don't think it collects a lot of pavement per se. But if water does build up in an extreme situation where you have an awful lot of runoff, um, it is really the only point of, um, you know, where, where, where flow can go, other than spill out over people's backyards and so forth. Essentially what you're saying, though, is that you are reducing the amount of area that will flow in that direction. Well, that's, that, that's our general approach to this. We're taking this red hatched area and diverting it into our storm drainage system so that there's a significant reduction in the amount of area. And there are no, you know, it, there might be a partial building, but there will be no entire buildings that will be within this yellow area other than the existing home that's there now. So it, it's going to reduce it significantly um, after we're through, even after all the homes are built, the, uh, the amount of flow that might go in that direction will be, will be cut pretty much in half. 
I also have some questions, if you could, on stormwater management. Um, could you please review for me what the DEP process is? Does it include an on-site visit? Does it stop at the Cape Elizabeth line, or will they likely look at the Charlotte Street or potential Charlotte Street impact? We've also had correspondence from a Mitchell Road abutter who is still concerned about the management um, on her property. and. We have a letter from her dated July 10th where she's still particularly concerned about the shallow swale um, of 250 plus feet taking the runoff to the culvert at Mitchell Road. Um, we seem to have conflicting opinions from two experts well qualified in the area. Can you okay. say what the DEP um, process might add? Okay. The, the second issue is the flock of tulis drainage. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll address that first um, and then I'll, I'll get to the mm -hmm. DEP thing. Um, I believe in, in uh, the letter that um, I, I saw from Lisa Flocktoulos that, that was just, just, just handed to us really earlier, she is concerned about this, this, this existing ditch crosses the corner of her property and then it kind of flows in an open swale down to the cross culvert here in Mitchell Road. I think her concern in this second letter was what what is going to be done to maintain this flow. Um, our point is, and I said this at the last meeting, that in order for water to leave our detention basin and flow into this ditch, it's going to take a storm in excess of a 100-year storm. I think she may have alluded to a 25-year storm in her letter, but um, based on our calculations, um, it's going to take more than a 100-year storm, which is, which is defined as a 6.7 inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period, um, which is essentially a hurricane um, for this part of the country. It just doesn't happen very often. But what we're saying is it would take about seven inches of rain for these detention basins to fill up to the point that there would be any flow leaving this direction, um, which, which, in our opinion, we, we, we've met the standard. A 100-year storm is considered the flood condition. And, uh, we're not going to flow onto her property during the 100-year storm. Um, so on a rare occasion, there might be some water flowing that way, but um, it is not going to happen very often. Um, as far as the DEP goes, we've submitted our application. They have a 60-day review period that they can take to review these applications. Generally, they take the entire period. Um, I'm not sure what the time clock is at this point, whether they've started it or not, but I, I think they have made a determination that they have a complete application, um, or at least they've got a, an application submitted, and they, they have to make this determination of completeness, just like the board does here in Cape Elizabeth before you start your 30-day your time clock on the subdivision process. They have a similar time frame that they have to live by. Once they start that time clock, they have to render a decision in 60 days. Um, they haven't done any substantive review. We've submitted plans. They've called us and asked for extra plans. Um, they've received plenty of correspondence. I believe that a lot of the abutters' um, comments that we're hearing tonight and I've heard before have also been submitted to the DEP. So they're fully aware of the neighborhood issues. How they will address those, um, I can't speak for the DEP, but um, I am assuming that they will take them all into consideration and uh, they'll be addressed through the review process. Um, you know, we communicate with their review engineer. We don't even know who that is at this point. Um, we've, we've got a project analyst who is nothing more than a, a manager. He doesn't do the detailed review. He shifts it out to the different staff people that he, he feels need to be involved in this. So um, uh, there is no limitation, I guess, really, in terms of what they can look at. If someone raises an issue that has something to do with drainage, they'll certainly take a look at it and see if they feel it's an issue or not. If, it's, if it needs to be addressed, then they'll ask us to address it. Thank you. May I go back to the well one more time? Right. Just a closing comment on the yellow area. Uh, the, the drainage towards Charlotte, Charlotte Road. This area here. Yes, sir. Given the, the number of comments we've received and the, the uh, apparent disagreement about what does or does not happen. I would just strongly encourage you uh, to obtain that spot elevation and to review the town engineer's commentary about adding an additional catch basin and whether it makes sense or not based on those elevations. I think that will not only help the board understand but hopefully clear up any concerns that the abutters would have as well. And maybe we could see that at the next session. Just a suggestion. 
the, I guess you want a spot elevation on the Charlotte Street catch basin and there was another. I believe that's what Mr. Harding suggested. And depending on how that may, matches up to the topography in Blueberry Ridge, um, you may or may not want to consider an additional catch basin on lot 12, which would alleviate concerns about any water that's, that would be directed toward Charlotte Road. Are you suggesting a connection into the catch basin on Charlotte Street? No, into the Blueberry Ridge oh, system. into our system. Yeah. An additional basin at the back of that lot that would connect to your system may make sense depending on how the elevation on Charlotte Road matches up with the, with the land that's shaded yellow on your drawing. This point seems to keep coming up and, it, you know, based on my reading of it, that would help clarify it quite a bit. So if nothing else, find out what the relative elevations are and then we can probably understand better. Yeah, Joe just uh, made, a, made a point that uh, there was some talk about a berm um, in one of the previous letters. Um, and uh, it was suggested, I guess this was the town engineer's suggestion, that um, we might put a berm here to divert any flow away from the, uh, the, the Sawyer property. I guess we didn't think that was such a great idea because if you do put a berm in, you're going to definitely cut all the trees down for one thing. And uh, I'm not sure it's going to really accomplish anything. But, uh, uh, you know, any of these things are possible. Well, I think his, his most recent submission said, you're right, the berm would probably eliminate a lot of trees and, and maybe be overkill. I'm paraphrasing. I don't know but he still did suggest that, letter, but, uh, he still suggested that you may want to consider an additional drain inlet yeah. on the back of lot 12. So all I'm saying is, is please take a look at that so we can... Yeah, I mean, put it to rest one way or the other. You know, it may be a case of if if we put in the inlet, will this put this to rest? Because I mean, I, I quite frankly don't feel it's necessary. Um, I think we've done a lot already to to reduce the amount of flow here. But I mean, if it gets down to the point that putting in another another inlet similar to the ones we've got all the way down the side of uh, Blueberry Road is going to put everybody's mind to rest. Maybe that's the way to approach it. Well, I'm certainly not trying to dictate that to you, but I guess yeah, what, would I mean, be, uh, you know. what would be a good idea in my mind would be to review that again and uh, consult with both the town planner and the sure. town engineer and see if we can come up with a consensus amongst that group so the board has mm -hmm. you know, a common set of beliefs and, and uh, presentations as opposed to differing opinions. Be happy to do that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, what I heard tonight was we want vegetation. We want buffers. And if we do the drainage, then you're going to lose those beautiful, uh, I think they're sugar maples, silver maples, whatever they mean, Norwegian maples, along, uh, along here. And it's what's more important. And from what I heard from the Sawyers, it's more important to have vegetation than it is to have a buffer, or excuse me, a, um, mm -hmm. a berm. But they can address it. I mean, we can do it, but you're going to lose a lot of trees. And from what I've heard for the last six months is we want, we want vegetation. So that's why we're a little apprehensive as to, you know, making that uh, added drain. But if the soyers want to speak, I'd, I'd be more than glad to listen to them. While you're on the subject of mm -hmm. trees, uh, Lisa Flacatulis made the comment, and I, I don't remember ever hearing about it, that there will be several mature oak and maple trees whose root systems will be destroyed. Um, it's had to do with the drainage near her land. It's on page one and the beginning of page two of her letter. Um, when excavations begin for the pond basins. And then there was another question about um, oak and maple trees along the southwest border. Will they be affected at all? Because I don't remember ever hearing anything about any trees in that area around her land being affected. Uh, we're talking in and out here. Yeah. There's, there's, I call them a choke cherry tree, and an apple tree that probably will be removed, and a couple of um, spruce trees that will come out. I think she's referring to prop, uh, trees on her property. I think we're far enough away so the root system will not be disturbed. Uh, there are a couple of trees here. There's a 30-inch uh, oak tree, and then I think maybe a 10-inch maple tree. And I don't believe the uh, the drainage system is going to be down far enough to affect the uh, the root system of those trees. 
But the trees here, uh, they're really not worth saving. The trees that are coming down, they're not the most attractive trees, and they will be replaced with a couple of weeping willow and some other trees. Thank you. Right. I have one question before you sit down. On your uh, landscape plan that shows some of the vegetation right behind you on the floor there, it, am I wrong, or am, am, was that fencing and vegetation along the back of the lots there, was that purpose uh, just to show the various options that are available on fencing, or is that exactly where the fencing is planned to be? No, this is an option. Okay. This I, is an option. I, I just, thought that's, I just wanted purposes. to get it on record that it For was conceptual just, purposes only, and I think there is a note in the plan that says either off will be, will be utilized. And I think I mentioned also that I've talked with uh, well, four neighbors, and we've, we're discussing what, what they want and what would be best for, for them. And I'm open to the discussion with these other people, the other butters, to talk about what, what would be best suited for them. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? A um, couple of points here for the, uh, for the board. Um, we have planned, uh, tentatively planned an executive session for either tonight or the 6th of August. Is there uh, with us tonight as our uh, town council is Derwood Parkinson, who may or may not have a comment tonight, but um, what's the wish of the board holding an executive session? Is it this evening or August 6th? Any comments? August 6th to me. I'm available. Okay. That's, we usually meet at 7 o'clock in the room behind there. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Um, any other questions of the applicant at this point? Uh, some, somebody want to proceed with a motion? Seeing no further questions, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of Joseph Astachi for final subdivision review and resource protection permit for Blueberry Ridge, a 19 lot subdivision located off Mitchell Road, be tabled to the regular September 17th, year 2002 meeting of the Planning Board. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Are there any further comments? Questions? Hearing none, I raise it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion presented, please show by raising right hand. Motion carries. Table till the September meeting. If you have any comments, you're welcome to make them. You can touch base with uh, Maureen relative to the time on the 6th. Would you touch base with Maureen? Well, she'll set the time. We have a couple of things on the agenda that night. We can either do it before or preferably after. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, I think she Thanks. We'll try to get some. The next item on our agenda this evening is uh, for Heritage Court subdivision amendment request by Laura H. McGrath for an amendment to the pre previously approved Highland subdivision to adjust the building envelope for the lot located at 4 Heritage Court Road relative to section 16-2-5 amendment, amendment to previously approved subdivision. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, respectfully request to recuse myself on this matter since I have a business relationship with Mr. Gilbert. Is there any other any reasons for not a... Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. 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 Good ev
Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, any more members. Um, I presented a uh, proposal at the uh, workshop on June 18th uh, regarding a, uh, requesting a 10-foot uh, uh, setback from uh, designated wetlands from the uh, Highland subdivision. Um, the current owners, Lauren Paul McGrath, um, uh, purchased the property uh, from Ron and Stacy Hodge. Um, my name is Arthur Gilbert. I live in Windham, Maine, and I'm the listing agent for that transaction. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Hodge also happens to be my sister. Um, I want to state that. Um, they purchased the land in '97 and built a house, and then uh, two years later, I believe, in November of '99, uh, they took out a building permit for a, a hot tub. Um, Mr. Hodge took the measurements and sketched in where he believed the hot tub to be, um, which, according to his measurements, were within the uh, were within the um, building envelope. Um, upon the uh, conclusion of the sale to the McGraths, a uh, surveyor uh, detected a an encroachment of uh, of the house by a couple of feet, a corner of the deck, and the entire hot tub lying outside um, of the building envelope, uh, the setback of the building envelope. Uh, and um, in an effort to uh, make the transaction go through, uh, we hired uh, um, James Logan from Alfrick uh, to determine exactly where the wetlands lie so that we could be more accurate in determining what a setback uh, what the setback actually was versus where the property, uh, where the buildings uh, encroach upon. Um, uh, to, to ensure that the property uh, close and the sale go through, uh, the Hodges escrowed some monies to, um, to, to approach this uh, through the planning board to try to get the, uh, the setback. Um, Mr. Logan indicated that um, the, the, the scientific means and methods of determining wetlands has increased greatly in the last eight years upon the, uh, since the approval of this subdivision, and uh, he very accurately depicted where the wetlands lie. Um, the um, survey subsequently went out and redefined where those wetlands were um, and indicated, uh, basically was able to draw a 10-foot buffer, which, which excluded all the encroachments that were, uh, were pending, uh, a corner of the house and, um, and the entire hot tub. Um, the hot tub is, uh, is constructed on a cement pad, um, fully enclosed with a roof, um, a, a very permanent structure. And so um, the request was to um, in, in, in enlarge the, the building envelope so that there was ceased to be an encroachment um, on, these, on these structures and um, the McGrath could then have clear markable title um, from that point on. Is there any discussion regarding this request? Looking at the comments from the town engineer and given the fact that what we're concerned about is, in the end, is the impact on the wetlands, since he says that the encroachments will not have an adverse impact on the receiving wetland, uh, I certainly wouldn't have any problem with the applicant's request. I don't seem to have any either, so do want to, any other discussion or comments? Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer a motion for the Go right board ahead. to consider findings of fact. Paul and Laura, <coughs> excuse me, McGrath are requesting an amendment to the previously approved island subdivision to revise the building envelope for the lot located at Fort Heritage Court, which requires review under Section 1625. Amendments to previously approved subdivision plans. Two, the revised building envelope will provide a 10-foot wide setback from the adjacent wetland. Three, the application substantially complies with section 1625, amendments to previously approved subdivision plans. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Paul and Laura McGrath for an amendment to the previously approved island subdivision to revise the building envelope for the lot located at Four Heritage Court to accommodate the house and hot tub be approved. 
Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Made and seconded. Are there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll raise it to a vote. All those in favor, show by raising the right hand. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Agenda this evening is the golf course zoning amendment request by the town council to review a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance that would list golf course existing as golf courses existing as of July 1st, 2002, as a permitted use in the RA and RB district, and add a definition of golf course, section 19-10 zoning ordinance amendment public hearing. Caputa Club came to the planning board uh, because they are in the middle of a master planning process and um, as good neighbors of the town came and met with the code officer to determine what they were allowed to do on their property. Uh, there are two pieces of property they're most interested in. The golf course proper, which is a large piece located between Route 77 and Spurwink Ave. They also have a second piece that they're interested in that is located on the west side of Spurwink Ave across basically from their entrance to the club. Um, the, the main part of the golf course is located in the RA district. The second piece is located in the RB district. And when we reviewed the ordinance, we discovered that uh, golf courses had never been listed as a permitted use in either the RA or the RB district. Uh, we felt that that had probably been an oversight because the golf course pre-existed the first zoning ordinance of the town, it just had never been included as permitted use because it had always been there. Uh, so at the, uh, what the town was looking at in terms of an amendment was to make golf courses a permitted use in both the RA and the RB district, and also to add a definition to the zoning ordinance that would say what was at, what constituted a golf course. Uh, the intent of the definition was actually to make sure that we talk not just about golf courses, but about the, those, those typical uses that are associated with a golf course. So the definition is intended to be all-encompassing to include not just uh, holes in the ground where people are hitting balls at, but also clubhouses, restaurants, tennis courts, swimming pools. N not that any of the things are actually being proposed at this time, but it is intended to be inclusive. Uh, what this amendment would do, and we have sent this to the Proputa Club and they have asked for a couple of changes, is they've asked us in the definition to go, and I want to make sure this is clear because this is a change from what you discussed at your workshop. They suggested talking about, um, the, the first part of the definition says attractive land out, laid out. Originally it said for at least nine holes, and the, and the Proputa Club is suggesting that that be changed to at least three holes. So that is what the current proposal is that's right in front of you, a definition that includes anything that has at least three holes we can call a golf course. Um, they've also asked that we include a driving range in the list of typical uses, and that has also been included. And we have put in, again, what was in the workshop, that these, these facilities could also be rented out for events. The major change from, from what you saw at the workshop uh, was we reviewed this, actually I showed it to the code officer, and we discovered that um, the board was concerned at the proliferation of golf courses throughout the RA and the RB district. And so this had been uh, drafted so that it would only make existing golf courses permitted use. A new golf course still wouldn't be permitted. And while that works in the RA district, because the Perputa Club is an existing golf course, that vacant land across the street, which is in the RB district, is not an existing golf course, and it, it's, it's uh, evaluated under our zoning ordinance as a separate lot. 
So under the RB district, under the permitted uses, it does not include the phrase existing. So only in the RB district you would have any golf course, and it wouldn't be limited to just this piece. It would be any land that's zoned RB in Cape Elizabeth. A, an existing or a new golf course would be a permitted use. It should also be made clear that any of these types of activities would, gener would trigger site plan review. So if anyone actually wanted to go in and build a golf course or a driving range, they would be back before the board for actual review of that construction. Yes, ma'am. Maureen, why was it changed from nine holes to three? It was a request of the Proputa Club, and staff couldn't think of a reason why it, it, it would be a harm to change it. I'm curious, though, as, as to why. Because the golf course is nine holes. Well, it's John Mitchell representing the Proputa Club. Um, you know, I showed the definition to the uh, members of the club. And it was suggested that could we change it from nine to three, uh, thinking that, you know, we've got 30 acres roughly across the street. It may be possible, you know, rather than putting a nine hole course, we may put um, three pitch and putt type of uh, fairways. Okay. So that, that's all. A practice fine. facility wouldn't be a. No direction. Yeah. Uh, Maureen, correct me if I'm wrong, but by taking out the, the existing limitation that we had proposed in the RB district, what we are doing in effect is someone that has land in the RB district can put in a three-hole private golf course, um, which would now be allowed under, under the zoning ordinance. Right. It's, it's opening the door a little bit more and then you had opened it at the workshop. We can say goodbye that we have a golf course in the RSO. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know how remote or not remote that possibility is, but I guess I would suggest that the two changes together make the possibility more likely because obviously it's a lot less uh, feasible for somebody to put nine holes or in a private piece of land, but three holes um, they might be able to. So if that affects the board's thinking at all, I, that's just my view that I think it makes that possibility a little more uh, realistic. Maybe another way to look at it is given the town's stated intent to preserve open space, if there is somebody in the RB district who has enough acreage to put in a three-hole course, be it public or private, that's a more benign use of land than a subdivision. It, it could be. Unless they put some of these other things on, like a clubhouse for <laughs> three holes. All subject to site plan review, though, before it happens. How much our RB district is available for that? Well, I was just looking at the zoning map, but there are a few um, lots, but it doesn't seem to be a whole lot. Yeah, the, the, R, the RB district, the, the largest section of RB district is the chunk of land that is bounded by Spurwink, Wells, Sawyer, and Sawyer. And it's only the large parcels. It's not the little two-acre lots that people have houses on. Uh, the RB district, just to refresh the board, is the growth areas of the town. So it also includes land behind Bothell's Garage, two, two parcels there, uh, Turkey Hill Farm down off of Old Ocean House Road, uh, and there's probably one other. And uh, the land on the west side of Sawyer Road just before you cross into South Portland. So those are all uh, large areas of undeveloped land that were originally design, uh, defined as growth areas in the comp plan because they were land areas that were best able to handle development because of their physical characteristic. Least amount of wetlands, least amount of ledge, least amount of significant wildlife habitat. 
Um, can I ask a question, Mr. Mitchell? Was there any comments by the board members regarding the ancillary uses? I'm oh, sorry, I didn't. Was, were there any comments by the uh, club members regarding the ancillary uses of this? Uh, no, they, uh, they reviewed it and uh, they couldn't come up with another ancillary use. So I think we've got to cover it covered. Thank you. This, uh, Maureen, is this, if what would happen on this would be, um, it would go to the town council. Would they have a hearing on it? Yes. Okay. So in its form at this point, if the board does not have a problem and, and uh, presents the motion, then it passes on to the town council. The town council will review it and have a, uh, a hearing so that the rest of the town members will know that it's an issue. Mr. Chairman, I'd also remind you not that there's a throng of people here, but I think we were supposed to have a public hearing too tonight. Re this. Regarding this? I think so. Yes. I remember talking about it, but I don't see it in here. <laughs> I think it was advertised as such. To make sure you dot the I's and cross the T's, the, the ordinance you know, process is... Probably won't take very long. You want to open the hearing? <laughs> no, you do it so Should well. Do we have a hearing? <laughs> we open the hearing. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to get up and speak? I don't know what you're here for. We would have well, to go here is someone. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is John Green. I am speaking uh, as the property manager for the Sprig Corporation. Uh, the corporation, we are very supportive of the Perpuda Club's plans for expansion in the RA and the RD district. Uh, but we would like to encourage the planning board to take this opportunity to make uh, golf courses an approved use in the RA zone in general. Uh, we believe that a golf course might be an attractive option for large landowners who might otherwise be inclined uh, to consider residential development. A golf course with its open space is in keeping with the largely rural character of the town, especially where the large landowners are located. Golf courses are compatible with other approved uses in the RA zone, if not more so, uh, in the sense of uh, rural character. Uh, the planning board would be able to exercise adequate controls over any issues involved in construction through site plan review, as you had previously stated. Making the decision to allow golf courses in the RA zone might someday have an impact on a landowner who is deciding between tract housing or maintaining open space. At the very least, it gives the landowner and the town another viable option. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Jeff. Any further discussion? Chairman, I think that's excellent input, and what that says to me is that we should be cautious about engaging in anything that remotely resembles spot zoning, since other landowners may have a differing opinion. So, excuse me? That's a good idea. I'm sorry. Everybody's here. We've closed the public hearing. <laughs> um, what would be a suggestion? I think what, must, what Mr. Green was suggesting is that the, uh, the draft zoning amendment that we submit to the council in the RA district, rather than stating golf course existing as of a date, we just say golf course, period, as it would for the RB district. So rather than grandfathering the Puputa Club, we'd be opening it up in the RA and RB districts as a permitted use in either district for the future. That, if I believe, is what you're suggesting. Um, I certainly understand the request. I'm a little bit troubled by the three holes, though. I mean, I think that somebody could come along. We can end up with something we may be very sorry for if we allow people to put in three holes. That if we're going to allow a golf course, we should allow a golf course, and a golf course is nine holes. Now, maybe there's a special request Perputa could make, you know, to have that waived for them. But if we're going to be inclusive about it, I think we ought to stick to what a golf course is. I think, you know, just, just for a, a comment here, it's pretty hard to really define a golf course number of holes, because they have 18 holes and nine hole courses. 
I've never seen one less than nine holes, fewer no. than nine holes. No, I understand. So. I guess I appreciate the, the request that we make it a, a permitted use in, in the RV district, but frankly, I, I'm not at a point. We have to look at the context of how this came to us, which was the Proputa Club that's been there for umpteen years it was not in a permitted use, and obviously that had to be corrected. We weren't going to tell them to dig up their golf course do something else. So in that context, I, I think we are certainly justified in approving it and limiting it as much as we can to, to the Paputa Club. The whole issue of whether golf courses in a general sense should be allowed in the RB district, frankly, I don't think I know enough to be able to say, absolutely, go ahead. I mean, golf courses, I don't know that much about it, but there are lots of issues about using chemicals and, and the, the runoff from the chemicals and use in terms of balls going off of the golf course and, tra and people using the golf course that I'm not prepared to just say today that's a fine use in the RV district. I just don't really know enough. And I guess to, to take that leap in the context of how this came to us, um, I just don't think we're, we're there. Uh, at some point, if someone seriously wants to consider a golf course in a certain area and they want to change the ordinance and, and we really need to look at that uh, in the grand sense, uh, we should probably do it. But without having more information, I'm certainly not prepared to say that's fine uh, anywhere in the RV district. Question, Maureen. Um, if one, if if the way this change in the ordinance is written, as we have it in front of us, um, was to pass the town council, and down the road somebody in the RA district decided that they've got enough land to build a golf course, uh, they would have to approach the town to change the ordinance at that time same as Paputic has the RB zone. Correct. And that procedure would go through the same procedure that we're presently going through with this. Correct. Mr. Mitchell. Uh, it's my understanding from reading Maureen's memo that if, if it, and correct me if I'm wrong, if a date is attached to the uh, permitted use in the RV zone, then we really can't do anything with that land. Is that correct? correct. Including ancillary uses. Correct. Okay, I, I just want to make that clear. I don't know if everyone understands that, but I think that was one of the reasons we that it was done that way. Right. Yeah. And the, and the the draft that I that I submitted to the board has a date attached to the RA district, right. no date attached to the RB right. district. So, so if, if, if the way it's currently drafted is what is finally adopted by the council, the Perputa Club would have the opportunity to look at putting other things on that lot across the street. Correct. Yep. If I may. Um, I share Mr. Sorello's concerns about, you know, if we draft this in such a way and it's adopted by the town council, then people could put up three-hole golf courses or nine-hole golf courses and use all kinds of pesticides. And, um, I think the implication is you'd rather see a forested rural area than a manicured, pesticide-laden uh, golf course. And, you know, and at some level, I share that. Um, I just, I have a concern about zoning in such a way that we allow a use for one landowner and not others. And hopefully the site plan review process, if and when somebody in the RA district other than Perputic came along, would address the concerns of abutters and, and interference and lights and, and runoff and all that. Uh, I would lean more in the direction of, of uh, taking out the grandfathering dating and allow the council, should they so decide, to make it more restrictive after having heard public input in that venue. 
and it's just a, I think it's just a difference of opinion. I don't think it's a factual matter, but I'm uncomfortable with doing things that are restrictive to one landowner, not another. So you would strike the existing as of July 1, 2002. In the RA in, district. In the RA district. Right. And the, and the reason for that would be that it would be let, less restrictive to other people in the RA zone. Yes, and I mean, as Mr. Green's presence here indicates, there's at least one landowner who would potentially like to have that right. Whether they ever exercise it or not, it would at least be a permitted use that could be applied for down the road. Um, and, you know, the, the comment that, well, they can always apply for a zoning ordinance change at that time seems to me to be asking them to go to a little bit too much of an extraordinary length. If we're going to establish an ordinance, we ought to do the best job we can with the data we have today. Um, but it's definitely a judgment call. I guess I'll go back to what I said before. Have we looked at the issue, I mean, take away the fact that the Paputa Club already exists and has land across the street in the RA district that we'd like to see them use in conjunction with their existing use. Have we done any analysis at all as to whether if somebody just came to us and said, should we allow golf courses in the RA district, um, yes or no? I don't think we've. I don't think we've looked at that. Again, I think the reason it's being allowed at all in the RA district is because the Buddha Club already exists. They have land in the RA district, which they'd like to use, and we're trying to accommodate that through uh, this this limitation. But I don't think the discussion has gotten to the point of, in the abstract, should the RA district, as it consists allow golf courses or not. Um, I, haven't, I haven't heard that discussion or seen any information one way or the other whether it should. So again, I think you have to go back to how this came to us. And it didn't come to us as, should the RA district allow golf courses? It came to us as, well, the Buddha Club is already here and they have this land. They'd like to still use it. But in our effort to comply with that, we've put a restriction on it in the IRA zone. We, right, because we're trying to accommodate the computer. Right. But I don't know if we've discussed in the abstract, should the RA district allow golf courses in the grand scheme of things? My feeling on this is, uh, both sides of the street, is that I'd like to move this from our table to the town council, but I, I get the sense that maybe we need some more discussion in a workshop or something. That I don't know how comfortable each one of you are, the way it's written here. seems so simple at first, didn't it? Mr. Chairman, if you're interested in polling the board, I'm comfortable with the way it's written now, and I would also like to state that I support uh, Mr. Green's request and concerns on behalf of his property owner, uh, but uh, I believe in opening up a large portion of the town for the development of golf courses is something we should look at carefully in the near future if Mr. Green wants to pursue it. Uh, but I think tonight we should leave it as written with the date there and uh, just complete the task we started in the workshop a couple months ago and then move forward from there. Thank you. I would also support the as written version. Yes. Somebody want to make a motion at this point? I'll make a motion. Okay. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the materials submitted and the facts presented, the planning board recommends the golf course amendment to the zoning ordinance that would make golf courses a permitted use in the RA and RB districts and add a definition of golf course. Motion. Second the motion, made. Mr. Chairman. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further?
discussion or comments? All those who are in favor of the motion, please show by raising their right hand. All those opposed? Motion carries three to two. Three to, uh, four to two, I'm sorry. Um, having no further other business, is there any other business in front of the board this evening? If not, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion we adjourn. Motion's been made to adjourn. Second? Second. Second. Seconded. All those in favor? Meeting adjourned.